I am overly excited to speak to you all today, not only because you are my colleagues, but also my family for a couple years now. Some of you I have had the pleasure of getting to know, while others I'm brand new. My name is Zilat Lopez. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm also a licensed cosmetologist of 12 years. And I stand here before you today sharing my story, but more so to tell you how I got here. I remember the first day I came to ECDA. I sat in the lobby at Canoga Park, and I was nervous. I was going to meet with Tanya, and I was going to be interviewed for my first paid position as a clinician. I was scared. And as I sat there with my resume in my hand, I waited. And then something occurred. As I was sitting there, minding my own business, there was a client there with the little girl. And out of nowhere, I hear a scream. I hear a, what happened? What are you doing? The little girl had peed on the stairs. Yep, that happened. That happened. And that's when I knew this was the place for me. <laughs> This was the place for me. And it, it is humorous, absolutely. But more so, what is more touching is how the receptionist at the time took care of it with so much love and tender care. It was such a touching moment where I knew that this was going to be a good family. And right there and then, I made the decision that if they offered me the position, I would take it. And I did have other offers, but this was home for me, and I'm so glad that I did. And before this story, before that, I was a cosmetologist. I was a hairdresser. I was a barber. I worked for MAC for four years. And that was the first love of my life. That was my passion. That's what I thought was my purpose at the time. Because you see, I found that very, very young. At the age of 17, my father asked me if the world was perfect and you didn't need money, what would you do for a living? I'll repeat that. If the world was perfect, what would you do for a living? No money needed. In my brain, it grew about 10 times bigger. Because you see, I grew up in poverty. I grew up where my parents didn't know where the next meal was going to come from because they worked so hard. They both came to this country illegally. And that made my hustle even stronger. And in my father asking me this at the age of 17, I thought to myself, I want to make this world a beautiful place, but not the beauty that everybody thinks it is, the ones you see in the magazines, the ones you see walking down the, the runway. Not at all. It's the beauty that's inside all of us. Man, woman, it doesn't matter. Bringing the inner out. And that's what I dedicated myself to. So at the age of 17 and a half, I graduated in 2005 and got licensed in the state of California as a cosmetologist. I was the youngest in the state that year. My mom had to sign for my license because I was still a minor. From there, I thought, well, this is what I'm going to do. And my parents, coming from a place of fear, coming from a place of not enough, told me, honey, that's not going to work. You need to go to college. You need a plan B. And I told them, mom, dad, I have found my passion. I have found my purpose. And they told me, go to college. You never know what could happen. What if one day your body doesn't work anymore? You still need the mind. And I'm so glad that they did. Here's the thing. I'm going to share this with you to be vulnerable and to be transparent, because there's no other way to connect. I got into an amazing school. I was accepted. And my parents didn't sign for my loans. They refused. I was devastated. I worked my butt off in school to get the best grades and get into college. Do what you're supposed to do. And yet they would not sign. Today I am so thankful for that because I would not be here today with my number. And I'll share that with you in a bit and my numbers too. Because my parents refused to sign for my loans like most parents do and they take them off to school, I had to work two jobs. I had to work in the shop. I had to work doing people's makeup on the side, but also work as a tutor 
work as a teacher, work as a caregiver, whatever I needed to do to get the job done. Because my parents would not pay for my books. They would not pay for anything. Because they wanted me to know what it was worth. I took care of those books like I took care of my arms, my legs, everything. Because I had to pay for it. And I share this with you in transparency so you understand where I'm coming from, my purpose, and my passion. In having to work those jobs, I don't think it was an accident. It actually brought me onto my journey. Because you see, as I stand here before you today as a female, a woman of color, a woman who has graduated from college, and a woman who is debt free, and I really mean debt free. Last week, I paid my taxes, so I really don't owe anything. <laughs> that makes me the 2%. I am 2% of the population that has a graduate degree, a minority coming from parents undocumented that is debt free in the United States. The average student today in the United States owes $45,000 to start not interest, not a graduate degree. I'll repeat that, $45,000. You see, we sell the dream, but we don't tell them how to do it without debt. We don't tell them how to do it when they get out of school and they don't have to work extra jobs or something they don't even like to do to pay off that loan. That is my mission, to share this information with you on how to do it. And the key to that is having passion having clarity, knowing exactly what it is you want. And since I knew that, it was clear, crystal clear, like Cancun water clear. That's what helped me get through that. Among us, a lot of us are of a minority. And as a female, I knew that. I knew that in school because it was told to me. Because you see, as a female minority, I should have been pregnant by the time I was 16. Right now I'm 30. I should have been on my third kid on welfare, no education. These are statistics. It's sad, but it's true. Not everyone, but it is what it is. In college, I had a professor. I thank him. I thank him for building me stronger. I was ill in college and I missed my final exam. So I did the responsible thing and I went to my professor and I told him, Professor, I'm so sorry I missed the exam. And he stops me and goes, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm here to make up the exam, I told him. He goes, yeah, I know. Oh, you do, I'm so glad. I thought he knew me out of 120 students. And that wasn't the case. I said, I missed the exam. He goes, yeah, I know. What happened, you couldn't find a babysitter? And I said, no, no. I thought he had confused me with another student, but he corrected me and he said, well, of course you didn't have a babysitter, of course you have a baby, you're Latina. These are the experiences that have built me today. Or when I went to sign up for graduation in grad school, and they asked me if I wanted my paper for the student loans, and I said, I don't have any. They looked at me and said, oh, did somebody pay it for you? These are the type of stereotypes, statistics, that help build you. Because instead of crying, or being sad, or having them define me, I have found another way to bring my purpose and passion out. And that's where it comes into today's talk. This is where it touches us as an agency, as a family. One of the biggest problems that corporate America, companies, and businesses have today is a large expense. Can anyone in here take a guess of what the largest expenses, the most expensive cost a business will have? Any guesses? Advertisement. Advertisement. Turnover. Anyone else? Health insurance. Health insurance. It's none of those unhappy employees. 
this is the most expensive cost a company or business will have. Unhappy employees. How does that happen? It's very common actually, because they say no matter where you go, you'll find that. But I'm a firm believer that you will also find passion, purpose, happiness, kindness everywhere you go as well. What do we do about this problem? What do we do about it? What is the solution? I've thought about this over and over as I speak to different corporations. And the clear answer that comes to me is making the workforce see it differently. How can you see it differently? I'll explain. The misconception is that you go to school and then you get a job or a career. It's your choice. The difference is that a job, you trade your work for money, and a career is something you love. But you see, it's neither one of those. The solution here to the problem we're having is bringing your work to your job or career. I'll repeat that. It's bringing your work. What does that mean? Each one of us has a different purpose, a different passion that becomes our work. For some of us, it's becoming a better mother. For others, it might be changing the world one client at a time. But it's bringing your work with you. That's the most important part of coming through that door and saying, OK, how am I going to make a difference in this person's life, regardless if you are reception, admin, clinical work, or if you are the support team? It does not matter. Identifying your work is the most important aspect. Some of you might not know what that is. And these are some interventions, techniques that you can use to find that. One, get in touch with yourself. Not check in yourself, but really become in tune with yourself. Meditating, going to your own therapy, asking yourself, what is it that I felt when I did that? Did that feel good to me? What did my body respond? Do I feel excited when I park the car and I get there? Am I ready to jump out of the car? Or am I just staying in my car because I don't want to get out? These are the things you need to ask yourself. These are the important questions. This will lead you closer to what it is your work is, your passion. Asking others, do I seem happy when I do this? Even asking clients, was it fun for you today when we played that game in session today? It's the small questions that we never ask that really matter. Or taking the time in the hallway to say hello to somebody and really just be in tune with them. Just hear them out. It's one of the most beautiful gifts we can give. And that is your work. That is your purpose. We, all, we are all created for one purpose or another. But it is understanding that, what it is, how it works. The third to that formula is your hustle. That's the hardest part, you see, because when things get hard, most people will give up. What I absolutely adore about community mental health is the key words, do whatever it takes to get the job done. And when most of us are hired into community mental health, it doesn't really hit you until it hits you. Until you're out in the field with the client and it hits you. Yep, I'm community mental health. That's right. And it's either for you or it's not. You're either going to sink or you're going to swim. Congratulations, you're swimming. Congratulations. In knowing what it is that you want long term, perhaps for some of you in here, this is only a stop along your journey, and that's OK. But it's also knowing what it is you want long term, knowing what works for you, knowing what soothes your soul. At night, at the end of the day, when it's just you and your pillow, what thoughts come to you? What moments really spoke to you during the day? 
It's having that quiet time within yourself to know that, to feel that. And that is what has helped me. I'll share with you in transparency what brought me to be a therapist. As many of you might know or not, when you get your hair done, when you go get your nails done, when you go get a massage, they're not giving you the service, you're buying them. You are buying them and their time. You know you wanna talk about your neighbor. You know you wanna talk about your mama. That's what you're buying. Your hairdresser is your therapist. They are your therapist, they are your confidant. I had this client and I thank God for her every day. She changed my life. Out of respect for her family, I won't say her name, but I had her every Saturday morning for two years. Oh, she was like music to my heart. She was so amazing. She was later in her life. She would come in and I would set her hair because she would go see her grandbabies after that every Saturday. So she needed to be on point. She needed to look good for her grandbabies. And I saw her every Saturday. After a while, she stopped being regular. And that wasn't really like her because she would pay me and she would tip me, you know, the same thing every week. I loved it. I love routine. <laughs> and then her visits started to be less frequent. Less frequent and less frequent. And I would ask her, what's going on? And she said, oh, you know, it's just I, I wasn't feeling well. I was not feeling well. But I didn't pry. I figured it was just her privacy. It was her level of comfort. Okay. Six months go by, and one day, she doesn't come at all. No call, no text, a no-show. I was worried because I knew this client so well. So I go into her file, and I go into the emergency contact, and it's her daughter. And I call. She tells me that my client had passed away, that she had had breast cancer. And slowly, she had been dying little by little. And then reality really hit me. I realized that when I was combing out her hair, and more and more it was coming out every time, it wasn't because she was getting older. It was because she was going through chemo. She didn't lose all of it, but she lost a lot of it. And that's why the volume, the hairspray, was so important. And it's the small details like that that connected me to her. It hit me so hard that I went home that day. I canceled my entire schedule, no highlights, no haircuts. I went home. And I thought to myself, I wasn't her hairdresser. I was her therapist. And this moment changed my life. I thank God for her every day. Right there and then, my passion met my purpose. That's exactly where it was birthed. That's where it happened. And from then, I went back to grad school. But it wasn't an easy journey. I was rejected three times. I was a good student in undergrad. I had a 3.9, and I was rejected three times I applied. I cried every time. I figured this wasn't for me. I should just stick to be a hairdresser. Maybe I could do bartending, because I talk to people too. <laughs> and the third time, I found a place that really spoke to me, and then that's where I knew it's going to happen for me. But the key here is I didn't give up. Had I given up that second time, or the third time I took the GRE, I took it three times, because every time I wanted a better score to apply to a new school. My GRE score wasn't getting better. My hustle was, though, my determination. And that's what each of you have in here for your own passion, for your own purpose. I want to ask you this morning if you know what that is, if you know that you'll be the next 2%. What is it that you crave? What is it that speaks to you? And in doing that, I'm gonna have you explore it this morning. So we're gonna do an activity. Look under your seat, and you will find a piece of paper. Now, I want you to take a moment in silence, no phones, no selfies, just you. And write down what you're passionate about. Write it down. Keep it to one side only, one side. Write down the things that you are passionate about. If it's cooking, write that down. 
if it's drawing, making music, writing, whatever that may be. Now, for those of you that have identified what you're passionate about, what rocks your world, on the other side, flip it and tell me about your purpose. Why are you here? Why were you born? Why were you born? There's a very important statement, a quote that says, there are two important days in your life, two of the most important. The day you are born and the day you find out why. Give me your why. Because once you have your why, your life is going to shift. You're going to have clarity. Why were you born? What were you brought here to provide to others, to change, to give? Any brave soul care to share what their passion is? Sarah. Uh, my passion, mentoring other women, others, my family, um, helping others in general. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else care to share their passion? Uh, traveling, exploring, and helping others in need. Isn't that beautiful? Anybody else can relate? Anyone else for their passion? Now, here's the thing I'll share. If it wasn't for Tamika asking me, how are you doing? And me being willing to be vulnerable and transparent and actually tell her, I'm doing good. I actually just spoke at an event. I wouldn't be here right now. This is my passion, sharing my story in order to inspire others to follow their passion and purpose, their dreams how to make their hustle into their dream. Share your passion. Have that vulnerability. It will grow you. Becoming a better person and helping others become better. That's right. Now, moving into purpose. Purpose is a bit interesting because all of us come from different cultural backgrounds, ideas, families, upbringings. Purpose can definitely have a connotation of religion, but more so spiritual. What is it that you were born to do? Not necessarily what you do well. You can be an amazing salesman, but that doesn't mean that that's what your purpose is. Everyone has a purpose, and if you haven't discovered it, you are the walking dead. You are not living. You are the walking dead. I would love to hear other people's purpose. Would anyone like to share? Um, being there for people like, who just need someone to talk to, to help others who can't help themselves, whether it's a friend or a colleague or a stranger, if they need someone to talk to. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you for sharing, Catherine. Anyone else? My purpose is to be able to help others find happiness and also be happy myself. Yes. Yes. Anyone else? We are a family. Yes. Um, my purpose is to. Yes, yes. Different perspective, it's a beautiful thing. Now I'll share with you something that is private to me and that I don't share very often. I never really thought about purpose until a recent birthday that I had where I had a conversation with my mother about pregnancy, having children, and choices. Because as we all know in here, our work is pretty tough. We work with situations that many people don't even hear. 
yet we do. We have the ears and the heart for it. My mother told me that when she was pregnant with me, I being the first child with my father, they really wanted me. They waited four years to have me. And in her second trimester, she went to the doctor and they told her that I was going to have Down syndrome and that she should abort immediately. That this baby was gonna be a lot of trouble and that they didn't need that. My mother went home devastated. She hit depression, bad. And my father and her decided to keep me regardless of what the doctors had said. I don't have Down syndrome. <laughs> And I never knew that. It brought me to tears when my mother told me. More so because it solidified my purpose. It made me realize that my mom chose to have me. That I'm here to make a difference, as all of you are today. I have had the pleasure of working with many of you, and I am in awe. I am amazed every single day when I have a colleague that is a mother, a wife, a sister, a daughter, and she slays. She comes in and she is ready to work. And she still took care of her duties at home. That is amazing to me. Or fathers that work so hard for their children and give them a beautiful example of what it is to touch other people's lives. This is what motivates me. This is what inspires me. This is what I need you to do. This is my call to action. This post-it, this little piece of paper, I need you to not only place it in your heart and in your mind, but put it in a place that you're gonna see it every single day. Because that is your why. Once you have a why, you will get closer to happiness. You will be on your journey of purpose. And in ending today, I'll leave it open for QA. Any questions, any thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? Because I love feedback. I'm a therapist. But I thank you more so for giving me this opportunity to speak today, to getting to know each other better, to have vulnerability maybe with yourself if you don't feel comfortable sharing, but in hearing that it is possible, and to ask yourself, are you the next 2%? There are many na naysayers out there that will say, you can't do it. Yes, it's possible. When I chose a private school for graduate school, I was told over and over, there is no way you're going to make it without student loans. Yeah, you can. You work really hard, but you also got to know what you want. Thank you.